I so believe that in that creed that we say every single Sunday, there is a tool. A tool that will allow you to tap into joy, peace. Believe it or not, even more fun in life. Endurance, energy. If you really believe the gospel of grace that we just proclaimed just now. And so today, I want to encourage you to stop acting and to stop pretending and to take your mask off and to allow others to love you just as you are. That's very hard, isn't it? It's hard to stop pretending. All of us have a little bit of that. We are often like, often like peacocks with our feathers flying. And we fly these beautiful blue feathers. And the idea of the peacock is to seduce. So we use these feathers to draw people to us, to get people to like us and to love us. Very often, it's a deception, isn't it? Because peacocks can't fly. They're just pretty fat chickens. <laughs> and they're not getting anywhere. So, so much of our life is like that. But we really only receive power from God when we let go of having to prove ourselves to others and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not when we're perfect, but when we simply have faith and believe. Can I get an amen? amen. So I started to think about this. This is something a pastor said years ago, and I've never forgotten it. It came to my mind a couple months back. The Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. What if, at its core, all of the decisions we make in life are driven by one of two emotions, by either fear or by love? What if everything we do in life is because we're either really afraid and anxious or really in love and driven, reaching out, loving others? And I want to obviously promote the idea, the Christian idea, that grace, love, joy, that being motivated by it, those emotions is the good thing. And by the way, there is, when you have an argument with your spouse or your good friend, ask yourself the question, am I arguing from a place of fear or a place of love? I promise if you get in a knockout, knockdown, drag out fight from a place of love, it's going to go a lot better. You can ask the question, when I discipline my children, is it from a place of fear or a place of love? Be driven by love in everything you do and turn your back on fear. You're not a scared person. You're a brave person. Courage means even though you feel fear, you don't act from it. You act from a place of courage, from a place of love. Amen? See, love and fear are completely at odds because in order to experience love in life, you have to be vulnerable. You have to allow people to see you deeply. You have to be allowed to show people your flaws, your sins, your fears, your doubts, even your doubts about religion, your doubts about others. You have to be able to show yourself, and that's scary because there's a lot of judges out there, a lot of people who also are feeling shame that will be quick to reject you and judge you, and man, is that painful. So say goodbye to that character. Kill it. So... Shame is the great problem. Shame itself is the enemy. There's a difference between guilt and shame, and it's worth repeating. Guilt is the feeling you have when you do something that you know is foreign to you, and you reject it because that's not you. Guilt's actually a good thing. When you do something bad, and you go, that's not me. I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to change my ways. Shame is the feeling that I didn't make a mistake, I am a mistake. Shame says, of course I did that. That's who I am. Shame, the number one word that most describes shame is hiddenness. Shame is the part of our life that we are terrified to allow people to see. If people only knew this about me, they would reject me. So shame is the hidden part of our life. And shame is the number one thing, and this is psychology now, that gets in the way between us and connecting deeply with others, and I believe with God. Because the Bible tells us 
that, that, that Jesus came not only to remove us of our sin, but also to remove us of our shame. God's going to help you take that mask off and keep reaching out to others and to him and reinforce this deep, great relationship. So Hannah read from Luke chapter 18, which is a famous passage about the tax collector and the, and the Pharisee. And this is one of the most amazing passages. I love it because let me read it to you. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. Luke 18, chapter 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. What do you mean? Uh, robbers and evildoers and adulterers or even like this tax collector over here. <laughs> the laugh is not in this scripture. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. I tithe. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is a very powerful passage, easily misinterpreted by our Western eyes. So the first thing I want to point out is the tax collector. First of all, where are these guys in the story? Anybody pay attention? I'll give you the answer. They're in the temple. Okay, it's really important. They're in the temple. The temple is the place. It doesn't exist anymore. It was destroyed. But the temple was at the heart of, of um, Jew, priestly Judaism, meaning the way in which Jews get atonement for their sins. It was happening there at the temple, and it was the heart of Jewish life, and it was gigantic. It was one of the wonders of the world, humongous. And thousands of people would go there, and they would meet there. And so both a Pharisee, remember a Pharisee back in those days was a really good thing. A Pharisee would be like saying a pastor, a, a, a mega church pastor was standing there and just thinking, and I love how the prayer said, and the, the Pharisee prayed a prayer about himself. It was a great line. And the prayer was, I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that you've made me so good. <laughs> That's, it's terrific. And I'm just going to keep on fasting twice a week, and I'm going to tithe, and thanks that I'm not like that robber, and I'm not like that adulterer, and I'm especially not like that tax collector. Whew. It's a close one. Okay. So this is, a, and everybody's like, mm-hmm, yep, he's really good. He does those things. That's terrific. So everybody's lauding the Pharisee, and he's received his reward, which is a, a, an audience applauding him. And then you have this tax collector. The first thing I want to say about the tax collector is that the, the tax collector really was a bad guy. He wasn't like a misunderstood person like, say, the Samaritan. The tax collectors of those days were really rotten. They were employed by the Roman government, and the government would have them just go around and collect taxes from their fellow Jews who were being occupied by this foreign force that they hated. So you'd have, and then the way that the tax collectors made money was they got to charge their own personal interest rate and they never told anybody what was what. So in other words, there's no documentation or anything. Tax collector shows up at your door and he's like, today it's going to be 13, 15%. And this tax collector comes into the temple and he shows his heart to God. What I, what I think you're seeing in this story is not a tax collector who's experiencing shame. You're seeing a man who's letting go of his shame. This tax collector, imagine he would wake up every single day and he'd be like, all right, I've got to go collect more money from orphans and widows and old people and poor people. 
He's rejected by his community, by his friends, because of what he does. And finally, one day, he goes up to the temple to say, I'm done. And he just totally exposes his life. It's not like he does it in secret. He does it around thousands of people. And they all know him. He's their tax collector. He's their IRS agent. And here he is beating his chest saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. What you are seeing is not shame. You are seeing vulnerability. What you are seeing is not shame. You are seeing honesty. You're seeing a man who is finally coming to grips with what he's done. And he's saying, Lord, help me. I can't do it without you. And when he says I'm a rotten sinner, he's not giving birth to shame. He's killing it. See, when our shame dies, it dies in a place of vulnerability and repentance. Here's the secret about this passage. Again, I'm going to ask you, where were they? The temple. Okay. Now, here's the part of the... The Pharisees were in on something. Okay. They... They were, okay, when you go to the temple back in those days, it's the holiest place in Judaism. And one of the rules in Judaism is no idols, no graven images. And so the way that's interpreted is, you got Roman coins on you, denarii. And they have pagan images on them, satanic symbols, Caesar, right? All the stuff. And so they say, no, 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 no. You can't bring that money in here. If you want to come in the temple... You have to exchange your Roman denarius for Jewish shekels, which are kosher. So what would happen is, you'd have all these Pharisees or their people along the entrance of the temple, and you'd have to exchange your, you know, evil money for religiously appropriate money for the temple. You follow me? Now, what happens in that exchange? If you travel, you know exactly what happens. A bunch gets shaved off, right? How many times, last time I came home from Europe, 150 euros, and I was like, here's $63. I'm like, what happened? Well, you got your taxes and then the exchange rate and then the bid ask spread. And I'm like, I don't even know what you just said. You just took a bunch of my money. <laughs> so that's what happens. They come in and a little bit gets shaved off the top. And then when you go back out, you can exchange that money back and then they'll shave a little more off the top. So anytime somebody wants to come to the temple, they have to exchange their money because it's unclean. Okay? By the way, this is what Jesus clears out in that famous scene where he's kicking over tables and stuff. That's how angry he is about this place. So, another story. Jesus is in the temple where? The temple. And there he says, to, a Pharisee says to him, so one of the pastors says to him, because he's trying to trap him, Lord, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Famous story, right? Jesus says to this Pharisee, give me a coin. Pharisee reaches in his pocket, flings him a coin, Jesus catches it, because he's awesome. And he, and he holds it up to everybody to see. And he says, whose face is on this coin? Okay, where are they? And what's allowed in the temple? Only Jewish shekels, right? Only Jewish shekels. And he holds up this coin in front of the leader of the religious people. And he says, whose face is on this? Yeah. Caesar. Who's collecting on all those denarii at the door? And who is following? And are the Pharisees following the rules they put on everybody else? Here's what I want you to hear. The Pharisee is a tax collector too. The only difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector is everybody knows the tax collector is a tax collector. And most people don't know the Pharisee is a tax collector. And here he is with the unction to say, I thank you, I'm not like this tax collector. (laughs) He is a tax collector. But he's secret about it. And man, does that make it worse. Man, does that make it worse. Uh, Here's what we learn from the story. We're all messed up. Everybody, everybody is messed up. A little bit or a lot. And the only people that are getting better are the ones that admit it. The ones that are like the tax collector. Not the ones that wallow in shame, but the ones that are vulnerable about their weaknesses and their imperfections. Because it is only in that place we grow. And that is exactly what Jesus teaches. He who humbles himself will be exalted. What a promise. He who exalts himself 
going to be on both. They're both tax collectors. It's just one is honest about it. We're all sinners. Only some of us are honest about it. We're all messed up. Only some of us are honest about it. And the more honest we are about it, the more vulnerable we are, the more we connect with God and with others. And that's why I'm thankful for you. Be, continue to be a real person. So you are loved. You are loved just as you are, not as you should be. And stop people pleasing. That will totally crush your soul and your life. Don't do anything to please people. Do everything to please God. And you will go far in life. You are loved. It's not a culture of shame. It's a culture of respect and dignity and grace, especially grace and love. God is teaching us that everything we do, do it from a place of love and not fear. When we put up our peacock feathers, we stay fat, pretty chickens that will never fly. Yeah, no, God wants you to, the Bible says he wants you to be like an eagle. Spread your wings and soar. And the only way to do that, man, is to be vulnerable. To let him in. To be seen deeply with all your fears, all your doubts, all your struggles, all your emotions, all your messiness. And to not put on a pretty face or try harder, but to let go, just trust God in all. That's what grace is. And let me just tell you, that we don't get to heaven by our works. We get to heaven by his grace, by trusting in him. You've got to be able to have an empty cup if you want God to fill it. So pour it out. Give it all to him. and He'll give, pour out your dirty water and he's going to fill it with a fresh cup of new wine. I think when, when we get to heaven, and this is what Brendan Manning asks, God's going to ask us, did you believe I loved you? Did you believe I longed for you? Did you believe I longed to hear your voice? Or did you think you had to prove it first? Did you think you had to have three weeks of good behavior before you could pray? Or that you had to go serve at a homeless shelter or, or do something like that before you could really, really be a good believer that I'm proud of? You don't have to do anything to get God to love you because there's nothing you can do to get him to stop loving you. And that's very good news. It's called grace. He loves you just as you are. Father, thank you for calling us here. We believe in grace. We believe in the gospel. We believe that Christianity is unique because it doesn't call us to do a list of things in order to get to heaven. It calls us to just have faith. And then we do those things out of love. Thank you. Thank you, God, that it's not by our power but yours. So we trust you. We hold it to you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen.